at it all week. Um, I knew, I just, uh, I don't want to say I know that sounds arrogant, but I sensed from the Holy Spirit that it was going to be a special day and um, a day of really intense worship. And, you know, last Sunday I went to a, um, a friend's church in town, um, Christ Chapel, and uh, their pastor, John Wood, and I couldn't be any different. And yet, when it comes to our faith and um, our, our desire to see people saved, we're identical. And I went there just, I, I don't know, it was like 20 to 10. Their service starts at 10 o'clock. And um, I just felt an unction to go. And I very rarely hear other people. I'm very, I'm very particular. I don't want to be <coughs> marinated in something that I shouldn't be marinated in. So I figure if I read the Bible and spend time in God's presence, I'm really safe. And I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to other people. That's not my point. But there were so many points being made, I realized that, you know, the Holy Spirit is sending out different points to different people that only the Holy Spirit can do. Um, and when I left, it was hard to sort of remember. I was trying to even remember the main part of the message, and I'm sure that happens to you guys. But today, <clears throat> I think it's, it's going to be very simple, and I think it's going to tweak our hearts towards God. Um, which is which is more important than remembering what was said, you know. The change, the transformation is important. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but two people came up, and really, what was happening is, you know, I said to Bernadette, "Look, they're like the cherub, and uh, on either side of the ark, and they're looking at the blood." Do you know how fortunate you are that? You applied by faith the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts and lintels of your heart. Do you understand that the angel of death is coming? There's no way you're going to hold him back. And the only way he's going to pass over you is if he sees the blood. You know, and if I were you, I'm not you, but I would apply it fresh daily. Um, well, the we have good news and bad news. The bad news is the book is out of stock again. It won't be back in stock because people are ordering a hundred, a thousand. Some lady in South Africa just ordered a thousand for South Africa. And <clears throat> it's, it's really turning out to be a really great witnessing tool. I highly recommend, if you, if you can't afford it, I'll, I'll give it to you. You would say, Rabbi, I want 30 of them to put in my car. I'll give them to you. You know, neither the publisher nor I am looking, are looking at this with money in mind at all. Not, a, not the least bit. Um, we have a lady in Texas that is, she's going to be very surprised that I'm reading this. But she's running with this thing and she's calling prisons because I really think it's going to work well with prisoners, really. And my prerequisite is that the chaplain, so if you know, if you know a, a chaplain, a prison chaplain, they have to read it. Because if you know anything about the prison system, they don't get resources. So they'll take anything for free. But it might sit in the corner of their office, and I don't want it to sit in the corner of the office. So I want them to read it, and they could say to me, look, I, it's not for my inmates. I, it's not going to hurt my feelings, not in the least bit. But if they read it and feel like, I could definitely use this. I'm going to give this out to the inmates. They can have as many as they want. So I know a lady just wrote in. She's a prison chaplain up in northern Minnesota. Um, she asked for two caseloads of books, 312 books. Um, we got to wait. Everything's on back order till April. But So this lady in Texas is calling prisons. I, I want you to hear what she did, Burn, this week. This week. I wanted to update you on all the chaplains that have been sent books. She spoke to them and she sent them a book. I have to follow up once the chaplains read it. Ulster County Jail in New York, Franklin Correctional Facility in New York, New York State Department of Corrections, 
Clinton Correctional Facility, New York, New Mexico Correction Facility, New Mexico, McConnell Prison Unit, Texas, Oliva Prison Unit, Texas, Estelle Prison Unit, Texas, Ferguson Prison Unit, Texas, there's about 20 others. That's what she did in a week. And she's a broke homeschooling mom who has plenty of issues to deal with. I hope you don't think I'm using this to convict you to do something. But truth be told, maybe the Holy Spirit is. Um, last but not least, I got a, a text burned. Can you hand me the phone? I got a text from Maximus last night. You know, he's pretty homesick. He loves Macon. He's, this place country fried him for sure. Um, but we talk just about every day. I think every day. Uh, and this is what he wrote to me yesterday, last night, pretty late. He said, hey, Dad, the craziest thing just happened at the gas station across from my apartment. A lady stopped me because she heard Modest Yahoo playing, and we got to talking about Judaism, and she asked me if I've ever heard of Messianic Judaism. <laughs> we started talking, and she was asking me questions, and I rocked her. And she goes to me, I watched this rabbi that reminds me a lot of you. It's Fort Worth, Texas. I was like, who? And she goes, his name is Rabbi Greg Hirschberg. And she goes, quote, you should listen to him. I was like, really? And I just started laughing. And she goes, what's so funny? And I go, well, I, I have indeed heard of him. She goes, really? And I was like, yeah. He's actually my teacher and has been for some time now. She goes, you watch him? He said, I got one better for you. I was raised by him. And she just hugged me and started crying. Um, yeah, I guess I'm telling you that to say, don't despise small beginnings. You know, the world tells you you got to win the Super Bowl, you know. All, all you got to do with God is be obedient. No matter how small it looks, it's maybe a big deal to God. If God tells you to do it, it's a big deal. Amen. And if it's a big deal to God, then it should be a big deal to you. Amen. Um, okay. Uh, this is not going to be, you're not going to get any great revelation. We're not going to tell you who all the witnesses are. And you're not going to walk out of here puffed up with some additional knowledge. So let me just say that from the start. But some of the most simplistic things about our faith are some of the most sublime things about our faith. And it's actually the simple things that people struggle with. Um, Webster's definition, Webster was a believer, believe it or not, and the dictionary that he penned, worship is defined as reverent honor and homage to God. That's the definition. Reverent honor and homage to God. The origin of the word comes from the Old English, worthship. That's the original word, worth-ship. Worth means having value or excellence. Ship is a native English suffix denoting condition. So the origin of the word worship comes from a word meaning excellence of character. Praise is different than worship. Most people think they go hand in hand. Praise, worship, they're kind of synonymous, right? They're analogous. Not not, not even close, actually. They're not even close. Let me show you the definition for praise. In the Hebrew, it's halal. And it's to make a boast or to celebrate. That's what praise is. You know, people that praise the Lord, no offense, but they're very loud. You know, they, they tend to, they can't even hear from God because they're so, like, if God's trying to talk to them, it says, not now, I'm praising God. 
Um, worship, on the other hand, is a totally different word. It's shocha, and it means to bow down, to prostrate oneself and pay homage, to cast oneself face down on the ground in humility, submission, and adoration. So I just want to put, I just want to split screen these so you can see how different they are. They're really very, very different, and I'll, I'll explain, okay? We'll leave those up there. Praise is the joyful telling of all God has done for us. Praise is connected with thanksgiving. It's saying, basically, we appreciate all you have done for us, oh God. We thank God. Praise is universal, though. Praise can be applied to other relationships as well. We can praise our families. We could praise our friends. We could praise our coworkers. We can even praise our house pets. Good boy. Good boy. Praise is just righteous recognition of another. It doesn't require much from us. Praise is easy. Somebody does something good for you, you, you praise them. Easy, right? Just a big hand, a bravo, hurrah, a big round of applause. Let's have a big round of applause. Worship, on the other hand, comes from a very different place. Worship comes from a deeper place. Worship, as opposed to praise, is reserved for God and God alone. Worship is the art of losing oneself in adoration of another. Praise is usually loud, joyful, uninhibited, but when the Bible mentions worship, the tone totally changes. You know, picture yourself going up a mountain to meet with God, and you're all excited, you're going up with an entourage, but when you get to the top of the mountain and you realize who's there, you just hit the deck. It's through worship that we realign ourselves. It's through worship that we invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to convict us, and to comfort us. Worship or its derivative is used over 300 times in the Bible. The word worship first appears in the Bible in chapter 22 of the book of Genesis. And just for your edification, you might know this already. I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know. But sometimes hearing it again, you know, repetition, we learn from repetition. In the Bible, usually, the first occurrence of a word often sets the pattern or the tone for its usage throughout the whole scripture. Besides Golgotha, uh, to me, there's nothing more disturbing than the binding of Isaac. Even as a former Orthodox Jew, I was very disturbed by that story. Just heart-wrenching. Um, but when you see it, you can see how love and worship go hand in hand. Worship is connected to love and love is connected to worship. Let's just take a look at those five verses in Genesis 22. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham. God puts us to the test. How dare he? He made you. Amen. We, we don't, you, maybe you don't realize it, but you put your kids to the test. Right. You see how they're going to, you give them a little rope and see what they're going to do with it. He said to him, Avraham, and instantly, he nanny. You know, people always trying to get a confirmation. I know, I understand that, but you should know God's voice. He said, take your son. Look at how this pyramids. Take your son, your only son, you know, the one you love. You waited 100 years for a kid. And you guys are as tight as can be. You just have this crazy relationship. And go to the land of Moriah. Okay? Maybe there's something at Moriah that... He needs to see, that I need to see, that we need to see. Okay, I can do that. When you get there, offer him as a burnt offering. What? You want me?
want me to sacrifice my only son? I, I, I don't get it. How, is, how does that connect to you being a loving God? Well, Abraham prayed about it and prayed about it and prayed about it and a year and a half later. Now, maybe we need to insert some other names in there if it was a year and a half later. Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him together with Yitzhak, his son. He cut the wood for the burnt offering, departed, and went towards the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place in the distance. Boy, it must have been a rough three days, huh? Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go there and worship. A total act of worship. So look at the word love. It's used first here. And it's going to set a tone, a hob, to show our love. It's not a noun. It's not a philosophy. It's not an ideology. It's not something we talk about or explain. It's something we do. Right. Love without action isn't love. I love you, honey. Then stop doing what annoys me. I told you it annoys me. Don't tell me you love me and keep doing something that you know annoys me. You don't love me. That was just for you, sweetheart. <laughs> and then we look at the word worship, and you saw it before. Bow down to prostrate oneself. You know, in adoration, you know the word now. You get the feeling of it. So what are you saying, Rabbi? I'm saying that to love God is to worship him. And to worship God shows our love for him. I know it's heavy stuff. Maybe I'm just obsessive. Maybe I've got a problem. Maybe you need to, to not listen to me all the time because I, I am, I'm compulsive. I'm compulsive. I, I tried, you know, you name it, I've tried it. Jumping out of planes, hot air balloons, bungee jumping, surfing. And I always walked away from all these things and went, it's okay. Like, I, I'll, I don't ever have to do it again. You know, some people, I have a friend that jumped out of a plane, and now he's jumped out 160 times because he loves it. You know, he just loves it. It fires him up. It gets him excited. There's nothing wrong with that. I used to think there was something wrong with that. There isn't. But nothing does it for me until I met Yeshua. So you, be careful when you're processing the things I'm saying. Make sure that it's biblical. Make sure that the Holy Spirit goes, this is, you, this is right. And if not, just dismiss it. You know, don't get mad at me. I'm just compulsive. But if we truly love God, and truly is, is, is the key adjective, then we would submit or deny ourselves, which basically means to yield to God so completely that we have no rights whatsoever. Now, is God a horrible taskmaster? I haven't ever felt that. Does God not allow me to have time with my children and my wife and laugh and watch a stupid movie? I, I don't think he minds that. But if he calls on me, he nanny. Yes. If he wants to interrupt my agenda, he nanny. If he wants to send me to some God-forsaken country. Do we understand the roles? I do the preaching and you sit there and look good. Yeah, I did. And thankfully, Hineni, you were there, right? If our love was true, if our love was true, true love, we'd be willing to endure shame, suffering, perhaps, perhaps even martyrdom for his sake and his great name. That's true biblical worship. 
Fear, of course, is closely connected to worship as well. Um, today, I don't know, man. I don't want to be the guy that cuts out the legs from the church to make myself taller. I don't want to be that guy. I'm not Messiah's militia or Messiah's cop, but come on. You see some of the expression. It's almost like it's, it's a bad teaching to tell people to fear the Lord. Uh, Deuteronomy 6.13 says this, you ought to fear I don't know your God. I don't know, unless Deuteronomy's not in play anymore. Uh, but sadly enough, this was repeated in, in Matthew 4 when Yeshua was tempted. So it's not like it's just something old that we don't have to apply to our lives. It says you. That's you as you. That's you. This is you and me. You want to fear Adonai your God. Serve him. Swear by his name. Look at the word fear. It's to revere, to be in awe of, or to be afraid. To be af I should be afraid of God? I would. I would. A little fear goes a long way. It's, it's to have this overwhelming, not just a feeling, but to be overwhelmed of reverence, adoration, and fear. And it's produced, not out of nothing, but that which is majestic and divine and powerful. Only God fits this description. God is grand and God is glorious and God is altogether magnificent. The Lord gave the Lord to Israel in order to protect them, to prosper them and give them peace. Obedience to the laws of God was not so much a means of gaining favor with the Lord as it was of showing Him love. That's how you love God. You do what He says. Biblical love is not just a warm sentimentality like we have today. You know, we just want to, you know, hang out with Jesus and treat him to a macchiato. Or worse yet, I see people wearing, you know, shirts, Jesus is my homeboy. And I don't find that funny in the least. Not even a little. It's a well-calculated decision to conform to the revealed will of God. Yes. Maintaining a healthy fear of God helps produce the heart of worship. Only God can redeem. Yes. Therefore, only God is awesome Amen. and worthy of worship. Psalm 111 verse 9 says this. He sent redemption to his people. He delivered us. There was only one way to be delivered, and that was to take himself, a portion of himself, and lower himself and toss on flesh and go through a hideous, torturous execution. Guys, I'm going I'm to tell you something. Maybe this is, again, nothing new to you, but you take everything that's beautiful, everything, anything. What, maybe you like volcanoes. Maybe it's oceans. Maybe it's mountain peaks. Take anything that's beautiful. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your kids. Take everything that's beautiful that ever existed from Adam and put it on one side of a scale and then put your shoe on the other side and his beauty outweighs all the beauty in the universe. And that's something that can't be taught. That's something that has to be caught. He decreed that his covenant should last forever. His laws are not going anywhere. 
they're everlasting. His name is holy and awesome. His name. No other name. The word name is Shem in Hebrew, and it means his reputation, his fame, his glory. What's your reputation? What's God's reputation? And awesome, Yahweh, again, it, it falls under the, it's to revere. All these words, fear and worship and awesome, they, they're all interconnected. To be in awe of, to be afraid. His name and his reputation is awesome. It was a word used in the Bible for many years. This was, Psalm 111 was written 3,000 years ago. Awesome is not a new word. It's just used differently today. Everybody knew back in the Old Testament, God's fearsome. God's awesome. It was reserved for God and God alone. And then in the 60s, during this revolution that started, the me generation, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, Satan's like, I got to lower God. I got to lower him. I'm tired of him getting all this praise and glory. What about me? So one of the things he did was, sadly enough, he, he used the word as a slang term to mean very impressive. So we start good Christians. Oh, that white convertible is awesome. No, it's not. It's just a car. I don't know. Things never had hold on me. You know when people live in a house like 30 years and they, and they move and they start crying hysterically because this is where they raise their kids? I could care less. I couldn't care less. I'll leave the house in a heartbeat. I mean, if the house was on fire, the first thing I do is take my Bible and I go, ooh, burn that in the kids, right. <laughs> I really believe it was a tool used by Satan to lower the Lord in order to lessen the ascription of worship. This is what's going on today. Satan is insidious and he's doing the best he can to lower God in our hearts. He can't fight God. He tried that. The fight lasted. It was a very short fight. It was like, I will make my kingdom rise. The trap door opens and he's out. They didn't finish the sentence. So he can't do that. So he's trying to lower God in your heart so that you don't worship him like he deserves. You don't ascribe to him to give glory to his name. And there's no fear anymore. So you know what? Maybe I'll compromise a little. Maybe I'll fall to the temptation. Maybe I'll worship him and a bunch of other stuff too. I got a lot of room in my heart for both. And this is what he does. This is who he is. The psalmist tells us to bow down and worship. Look at Psalm 95, 6. Come, let's bow down and worship. Not just come and worship. There's a posture. Let's kneel before Adonai who made us. Bowing down, you know what bowing down means, but it means to sink down to one's knees. And why? Because of his glory. Look at the word. Because he's heavy. When, when God's presence is around, you, you sink. You sink, man. You don't have a choice. Because Yeshua is part of the Godhead, he must be worshipped as well. Look at John 18. This is a beautiful section of Scripture. I'm sure you've caught this a million times. Forgive me. Forgive me for not sharing anything new with you. Yeshua, who knew everything that was going to happen to him. He knew everything? It's part of the Godhead. He went out and asked them, the Roman guards, the temple guards, some of the Sanhedrin, Judas Iscariot. He knew they were coming for him. He knew his time was short. He knew it was time. He knew when it wasn't time, and it's time. It's time. So he said, whom do you want? He knew. 
It's like when God said to Adam, where are you? Think he lost Adam? He was saying to Adam, where are you? Yes. Where are you, kid? Whom do you want? Yeshua from Nazareth, they answered. He said to them, quote, I am. Yes. That was very purposed. Yes. He didn't say, here I am. Also standing with them was Yehuda, the one who was betraying him. When he said, I am, they went back with, that's falling out. Yes. Not the nonsense you see today. Thank God a lot of that nonsense is over. Yes. You want to get slain in the spirit? You don't need nobody behind you catching you. No, you're right. And you don't need me laying hands on you. Right. When he said, I am, they fell backwards. And they felt, why? why? Look at the word fell or fall, to, to be thrust down. Of those overcome by terror or astonishment, they were blown away. Metaphorically, to fall under judgment. He's the judge, man. They were in court and they killed the judge. Not good. The revelation was so overpowering and so glorious and so heavy, they fell like dead men. Yes. Every knee will bow. Every dang knee. This is not speaking of universal salvation as some teach. Sadly enough, not everyone will be saved. It does teach that those who do not willingly bow the knee to him will one day be compelled yes. to do so in the future. All those who mocked him, who made fun, who said, God, if this is the only way, I, I, I'm not interested, they'll bow down yes. and they'll realize the mistake they made. And at that point, it will be too late. And for you that haven't made that decision, you've heard it today, so you have no excuse. You can't claim ignorance. The psalm we read this morning says to lift up the Lord in worship. Look at 99.5, just one verse. Exalt Adonai our God. Prostrate yourselves at his footstool. Or worship at his footstool. Why? He's holy. Yes. He's holy. What does that mean, Rabbi? That means when you come into his presence, hit the deck. That's what it means. That's my theology on that one. Look at the word exalt. Room. It means to set on high, to raise up. You know, I want to tell you something. It's, it's hard. What do you, what, I've heard this a million times, right? Exalt the Lord, exalt the Lord. How do, I do, how do I raise him up? This is my advice. Maybe this might be something new for you. I don't know. But sometimes the best way to raise one thing up is to lower another. Look at how Yochanan puts it in John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. The entire object of John's ministry, you want to know why he was discipled that Yeshua loved? Because it's summarized in this verse. He worked ceaselessly to point men and women to the Lord and to make them realize his true worth. Humility is the name of the game, not false humility. Not looking for applause and then going. Come on. <laughs> Listen, that's bull crap and the Lord knows it, so cut the crap. Yeah. Stop looking for a pat on the back or patting yourself on the back and make believe you're not interested in compliments. The word increase means 
to become greater, to magnify, to yes. become more. Yeshua must become more important. While I decrease, I make myself less or inferior. I lower myself. I become less important. And then it's not a suggestion. It says must. Look at the word. It's necessary. You want to be a believer? It's necessary. It's an imperative requirement. It's not a suggestion. It's not a good idea. We're almost done, guys. I think you get the message. You might leave here and not remember anything I say, but hopefully the next time you get into God's presence, you'll have a different attitude. Maybe your attitude has to be adjusted, and maybe that's why you don't get God's presence. Back in the day, if you went to see a king and you turned your back before you got 10 yards away, you lost your head. How much more important is the king of all kings? I don't know if you realize it, but everybody's looking for something to worship. Yes. It, it, it's in our humanness. It's who we are. Yes. We want to worship. So people that love athletics, they worship athletes. I, I was a big-time athlete. I never worshipped an athlete. To me, they just had some God-given gift. And they were good at what they were doing. So? Oh, that guy crushes the ball. Okay. Is God going to ask you how many home runs you hit to get you into heaven? There's nothing wrong with hitting home runs, but big deal. He has a gift. Some people that love money, they look at guys like Gates and Elon Musk go, man. <laughs> so? They just have money just means they buy more stuff and actually they're more nuts because they got to watch their money constantly they have no peace I was big time into rock and roll but I didn't go see a Led Zeppelin concert and go I want to be Robert Plant screaming like that all the time I just thought hey they're gifted they're good musicians to worship I don't know I, de I never felt that way I never met anybody that I was, I wanted to worship, including myself, but I wanted to worship. There's a desire to find something bigger and better and something worth dying for. I, I think you're not really living until you find something worth dying for. Until you develop such a passion, then you're living. Look at Matthew 2, 1 through 2. After Yeshua was born in Bethlehem, you know, the house of bread, in the land of Yehuda, Judah, during the time when Herod was king, so we have a timeline, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, Jerusalem and asked, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and come to worship him. Who were these Magi? Take a look. Magos, the name given by the Babylonians and the Persians who defeated Babylon, modern day would be Iran and Iraq, to the priests and experts of old in revealing mysteries. The Magi most likely knew of the writings of the prophet Daniel. Yes. How? Well, Daniel went to Babylon and he became the chief of the court of the seers, the chief of the magi. And I would think that Daniel shared the prophecies of the timeline of Yeshua's birth. How else did they know that that was the star? A chokhab, the messianic star. He told them, this is how you'll know the Messiah is born. And so the magi knew that the Messiah was born and they came to worship him. Look at the word in the Greek because we're looking at the New Testament. Kiss the hand of. It's used with the ideology of how a dog would lick his master's hand. They came to lick their master's hand. In the New Testament, it means kneeling in order to express respect. It's a derivative. The Magi were truly wise men. They read and they believed God's word. They obeyed God rather than man. And they sought out Yeshua for one purpose. 
And that was to worship him. They didn't want nothing from him. In fact, they brought him gifts. Almost home, John 4, 22, 24. This is Yeshua talking to the Samaritan women. The Samaritan were half Jews, so they got it half right. They had their own mountain, Mount Gerizim, where they worshipped. They didn't worship on Mount Zion. They had their own priesthood. They had their own holidays. They had their own religion. They meant well. They were sincere. They were sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. Yeshua said to the Samaritans, you people don't know what you are worshiping. We, meaning me and my Jewish brethren, we worship what we do know, meaning the Jews had the right worship, but they were insincere. It was external and outward. So they understood the truth, but their heart wasn't in it. Because salvation comes from the Jews. But the time is coming. There's something in the future he's talking about. Indeed, you know what? It's here right now. Right now for you. For you Pharisees and you Samaritans, I'm offering you something right now. When the true worshipers will worship the Father spiritually and truly. In other words, right heart and right information. You could have the right information and have the wrong heart and your worship isn't received. You could be so sincere and have the wrong information and your worship isn't received. You know why? Because this goes hand in hand for what God's looking for. Yes. For these are the kind of people the Father wants worshiping Him. So He's looking for worshipers. Yes. We were born to worship Him. We were born to yes. give Him glory. Yes. But He's looking for worshipers who will worship Him sincerely with the right heart right. and the right way. Yes. God is spirit. And worshipers must worship him spiritually and truly. Do you see how many times in three verses the word worship or its derivative is used? Man, seven times. True worship means that a believer enters the presence of God by faith and there worships him. His body may be a den or a prison or a ball field, but his spirit can draw near to God in the heavenly sanctuary by faith. There can be no hypocrisy when it comes to true worship. There can be no pretense of outward religious ritual without legitimate inward relational reality. In other words, you can have your head bowed and your heart proud. Your lips can be close to him. Your heart can be a million miles away. Our God is a jealous God. Yes. He won't play second fiddle. There are graven images all around us. Yes. Is it okay to love your car? No. Why? It's just a way to get around. And if it gets stolen, you have insurance, you'll buy another one. Is it okay to worship a house? I wouldn't. I've seen home. Look, I've got some friends that are, you know. And yeah, they have a beautiful home. The home will outlast them. Is it okay to worship our, our 401ks? It's good to have one. The Bible says leave an inheritance for your kids. But how much? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not accusing, but think about it. You just have so much worship in you. 
if you divvy out to this and this and this, how much can you possibly give God? You're not a horrible person, but you just have so much to give. The pie is cut up in too many pieces. And you know, God deserves better than sloppy seconds. Some people worship their wife. Is that good? I don't, I don't think so. Some, some men think, oh, no, it's, it's good. I'm being a Christian husband. You, you're probably being manipulated in your insecurity. That's probably what's going on. You're afraid of your wife. You can't say what you really want to say. That's why you go fishing with your friends. I'm not sure what that means, but okay, Rafiki. Um, some people worship their kids. They really do. They're an idol. They don't really even realize it. Should you take care of your kids? Should you love your wife? Should you put away for a time? And yes, 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 and yes. But they're idols. I hear it. You don't re even realize it. They're idols. They're your idols. It's... Can, can your kids, can your wife, can your 401k say to you, I'll never leave you nor forsake you? When anything wastefully dominates our time, compromises our loyalty, or confuses our priorities so that God and his work take a back seat, we are flirting with idolatry. And it's insidious that's why we don't realize it. But if today you leave here and give a little less of your heart to those things and a little more of your heart to God, mission accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. You're all too familiar with this section where Yeshua is being, you know, he's being tempted. He's being tested. He's being tested. He's really struggling. I mean, he hasn't eaten in 40 days. He has the power to turn the stones into bread. It's very tempting, no? So here's just a section in Matthew 4. It says, The adversary Satan took him up to a summit of a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory, and said to him, All this I will give you if you bow down and worship me. Away with you, Satan, Yeshua told them. For the Tanakh says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Yes. So to serve God is to worship. Look, look at the word. It's, it's legitimately means to worship. Worship God. The Bible tells us that Satan is the God of this world. And the whole world lies under the control of his wickedness. So he had the power to give Yeshua those kingdoms because he's the God of this world. And Yeshua will get those kingdoms, but he'll wait till the Father gives it to him. Here's the bottom line. Whether it's the Torah, the writings, the Gospels, the fact is we are called to worship God and God alone. To worship God is to serve God. When we worship God and serve him, God is glorified. This is our very purpose in being. This is our destiny, to worship God. When we obey the Lord, we are proclaiming to him and the world, you are worthy, O oh God, to receive honor, glory, and praise. Last two verses of the day from Revelation 5. It says, and I heard every creature in heaven, every creature on the earth, creatures under the earth, on the sea, yes, everything, saying to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb belong praise, honor, glory, and power forever and ever. 
the four living beings said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. I think we should emulate the elders and the four living creatures. I believe this is the reason why we were born, to worship God. I think we just have to find something worth worshiping, and I believe we have. Last but not least, I want to leave you with a little quick story that might drive this point home. Scotland produced some incredible theologians, and Scottish people are pretty tough. They're just a tough people. Scotland is rural, and, and they're a tough crew. And their theologians, a few of them were incredible. There was this one theologian, he was born 1856, died 1942. His name was Sir George Adam Smith. And he tells how he and his guide were climbing the Weisshorn. That's in the southern Swiss Alps, 15,000 feet, crazy winds, glaciers below. It's not to be toyed with. So he's climbing the Weisshorn. It was stormy that day. They were making their climb on the sheltered side of the peak. When they reached the summit, they were filled with exhilaration. So Sir George forgot about the fierce winds, and he leaps up, and he's nearly blown off the edge to the glacier below, and the guy grabs hold of him, pulls him down, and says, quote, on your knees, on your knees, sir. You were only safe here on your knees. The next time you go into God's presence, I say, on your knees, sir. On your knees. You're only safest on your knees. Let's stand together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yivarecha charonoi v'yishmerecha Yor ponoi ponovelecha v'hunecha Yes, I don't know. We assemble. Shalom. I love you guys. Shabbat shalom.